How many habitat collected plants are in your collection? Do you even know? Do you even know how to tell? Poached plants, that's our topic today. Plants that have been unwittingly ripped out of their habitat and sold on to private collectors, in some instances for ludicrous sums of money. Today, I wanna to focus on three things. Firstly, why it's a problem, then, some of the different species of succulents that are most at risk from plant poaching before finally exploring just what we can do to ensure that we don't unwittingly support this heinous industry by buying poached plants ourselves. So let's jump down the rabbit hole and explore a topic that just drives me absolutely insane. Here we go. Why is plant poaching such a big problem? Well, to understand the answer to that question, we really have to be able to recognize the sheer scale of the problem. I'm not talking about now a private individual going out into habitat, digging a plant up and sticking it into a pot, though I certainly would not advocate for that anyway. No, what we're really talking about are essentially global criminal syndicates whose gangs go out into natural habitats and denude them of rare and exotic plants, whole habitats stripped of a particular species, all in the name of making a quick and easy dollar. Now, the only thing worse than the money-grubbing, scum-sucking criminals who run this industry are the absolute morally bankrupt fuckwits who knowingly, knowingly buy these plants. Driven by ego, driven by a desire to have the biggest, the oldest, the most gnarled looking specimen in their collection, I don't know. But whatever does it, there's a huge market for these plants, in some particular parts of the world especially. And the end result is that we're seeing whole populations of plants just stripped out of habitat, localised extinctions, or in some instances, loss of genetic biodiversity, which is going to result in the loss of a localized population anyway. A lot of the plants that I'm gonna be sharing with you today are already endangered, a threat from things like climate change and overdevelopment. They don't need the additional pressure of douchebags going in and wholesale removing them from environment, only for some dickhead collector to probably kill it in six months time anyway. No. Now, what we want to ensure is that as consumers of these plants ourselves, we're not unwittingly supporting a global criminal network that's destroying local habitats. So now I'm gonna share with you some of the species that are most at risk and hopefully help you to avoid from falling into the trap of buying any of those plants that have been poached. When it comes to poached plants, there's really kind of two categories that we can look at. Those that are taken opportunistically, they're everywhere, they're easy to get, and you can on sell them for a few bucks very, very easily. Then there are those plants that are old, gnarled, full of character, that to get them to that state in cultivation might take 50, 60, 100 years, and nobody's got time for that. And so they just rip them out of the ground and on sell them often for big money. The first plant species I wanna talk about today is one of those opportunistic ones. Early in the 2020s, COVID grips the world and houseplants become all the rage. And amongst all the different aeroids and everything else that I know nothing about, one particular species kind of popped into cultivation almost out of nowhere. I'm talking about Stephania erecta. It's a small, bulbous, kind of geophytic cordisiform plant that grows a vine with very beautiful, delicate leaves. Now these are plants that grow naturally in Thailand on limestone cliffs. And it turned out that almost every single plant that entered into cultivation in the early 2020s had been unceremoniously ripped off a cliff, shipped over to Europe, and on sold to a collector, usually for about a hundred bucks a piece. Wholesale mass deportation of these plants, thousands and thousands of them. Now, it's not an endangered plant, by any stretch, they grow like weeds over there. But does that really matter? Because there's so many of them, we shouldn't care about the removal of them from habitat. You do it enough, eventually it does become a problem. Now, there's a very easy tell to know if you're buying a plant from habitat 
particularly in the case of a Stefania. All the plants that were shipped off came essentially as what were termed bulbs. They're not a bulbous plant, but they just look like little kind of wooden ball essentially. No roots, no shoots, no anything. It's because all the roots get chopped off for ease of shipping. There are a lot of posts online at the time about how do I wake my Stefania up? And you can still find them even now on places like Reddit. How do I wake my Stefania up? It's not waking it up. You're trying to coax the thing to actually start to live again, to put out roots for the first time in ages because it's been sitting there dormant, coaxing the metabolistic process, not to start shooting a vine, but to actually almost come back to life. The good news is Stefanias grow relatively easy from seed and in cultivation, they grow a lot quicker than those growing on the limestone cliffs in Thailand. And so the end result is we're starting to see ethically sourced Stefanias coming into cultivation. If you want to buy one, make sure it comes in a pot and check that it's got roots first because pretty good tell. If it's got no roots, it's come straight out of habitat. There are other species of Stefanias that are entering into cultivation now as well. Often, you know, hey, you like the Erector, why don't you try the other species? Same story goes. Check for roots. If it's got none, steer well clear. Another family of plants that sort of sits in that opportunistically poached category is the humble South African Conophytum, like this Conophytum pellucidum. They're small, they're compact, they're beautiful. It's very easy to just go out into the wild, grab a clump, shove it in a sack, and send it off to whatever destination you want to send it off to. They don't fetch huge sums of money, but there are collectors in parts of the world who are very glad for them. The ridiculous thing is, they're so easy to grow from seed, they form clumps relatively quickly. It doesn't take 50 years anyway. No, this is just about easy money and a bit of ego having a slightly advanced plant without putting in the work. Similar story on the other side of the globe, a plant called Dudleya bretonii, colloquially called the Live Forever. It's a member of the Crassulaceae family and it lives on seaside cliffs in western United States, literally overlooking the water. Now, beautiful plant with these glaucous white blue leaves, absolutely stunning. And yet, there's a market for advanced plants, particularly in East Asia, where these plants, they get lifted up out of habitat by opportunistic collectors, shoved in a sack, and sent over the other side of the world. There have been recent examples where police, both in South Africa and the United States, have intercepted huge shipments. I'm talking thousands of plants destined for the markets in Korea, China, Japan absolute insanity. And for some of these plants, particularly conophytums, where the population might only be in the thousands, that could spell a death knell to the local or indeed global population of an entire species. And so opportunism in poaching, it's an absolutely heinous thing. But as we're going to see, some of these plants, it's not about opportunism, it's about the desire for an absolutely stunning and very old specimen. Many species of slow-growing cacti are the subject of poaching. I'm talking Lophophora, Areocarpus, Aztecium. But I want to focus now on one particular family of cacti that I suppose develops a fairly unique trait in habitat compared to cultivation. I'm talking about the Copiapoas. These are South American cacti growing in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And they have a feature that makes them particularly desirable to the sort of dickheads who do want to buy poached plants. In habitat, they grow the most incredible white farina, essentially a white sunscreen all over the plant, which can't really be replicated under cultivated conditions. The reason being, when we grow plants in cultivation, we kind of nurture them, we care for them a lot, and they grow relatively rapidly. In this habitat, this particularly harsh, dry, miserable habitat, 
under the beating open sun with very little water, these plants grow very, very slowly. And so the buildup of this white farina may take centuries. No one's got the patience to grow a plant for centuries. You'd be passing it on through the generations. And so the end result is that copiapoa grown in cultivation typically take on a sort of whitish green color. Whereas those plants in habitat are almost a thick, straight white. Of course, unsurprisingly, that makes them quite desired amongst, well, you know, those collectors we've been talking about. And so they get lifted out of habitat, once again shipped off, and you can find instances of collectors who prominently and proudly display their habitat-torn copiapoas featuring that thick, white, glaucous exterior, the scars of a life lived for hundreds of years out in habitat, just put them on display. Appalling. Now, that same, I suppose, we might call it the patina of an existence in the wild, has made the collection of a Madagascan plant, Pachypodium gracilius. Quite a desired thing. Now, Pachypodiums, beautiful, kind of often bulbous cordiciform plants. Pachypodium gracilius in particular is, I suppose, regarded as quite a cute plant, particularly in the East Asian market, because it's a miniature version. They have these kind of very round, almost flask-shaped trunks from which you get these rosettes of leaves. Again, these are plants that would take many, many years to reach a desirable size like this. And I suppose a bonus to the collectors who want them anyway is that patina that I talk about. They're often covered in lichen. They're covered in scars that have been caused naturally over time. They look weather beaten. You know, the perfect bonsai succulent specimen, I suppose. And so another plant species that gets ripped out of habitat and is being threatened by the nature of poachers. Which brings me to this plant, Euphorbia rapulum. Now, Euphorbia rapulum is a cordiciform plant, grows in the Himalayas, Western China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and the like. And before a few years ago, no one had ever, ever heard of this plant. Certainly didn't exist in cultivation. It's popped up out of nowhere, just like Stephania erecta. Also like Stephania erecta, a lot of people are kind of discussing how best to coax it back into growth. I've seen lots of pictures of the very, very slow emergence of what's billed as a flower, but is actually vegetative growth, just leaves, because essentially this plant is struggling to come back to life after it's been unceremoniously ripped out of its habitat. Have a look at the plant as it grows in nature. Looks nothing like how it's built in the literature. Now, why do I think these plants are poached? Because, just like Stephania erecta, it's popped up everywhere. There is almost no literature about this plant in cultivation extending back more than about two years. And yet suddenly, the internet is awash with people selling advanced and mature specimens on Etsy, on eBay, Facebook Marketplace. You can find them everywhere. They're all for about a hundred bucks a pop. This for a plant that seemingly nobody even grew more than a few years ago. How is it possible? Well, I mean, it comes from a part of the world that doesn't have the best track record when it comes to conservation and habitats. So, join the dots. I think we know what's going on here. My advice, steer well clear of Euphorbia rapulum, at least until we know a little bit more about it and we can start producing them in a horticultural sense, rather than just ripping them straight out of the hills that they grow in. So how do we ensure that we're not buying poached plants and supporting this heinous industry? Well, there are really two very obvious signs of a poached plant. 
The first of those is a lack of roots. Talking about not a cactus cutting here, typically that's going to be perfectly fine. But if you're looking at a cordiciform or succulent plant, especially one that's slow growing, a lack of roots is often a very good sign that it's been taken from habitat, purely because dealing with a root ball is too much effort for a poacher. Chop the whole thing off, ship it without it, and let the buyer deal with that problem later on. The second is, I suppose, what I described as that old age patina. Like in a copy of Poa, it might be that thick white farina, or in some instances, you might see old age battle scars from a very hard life lived in habitat. Could be something like lichen growing on the plant. These are things that we don't ordinarily find in plants that are sold in cultivation. Now that's not a general rule. There are certainly plants that will grow that thick white glaucus farina. Stenocereus bonecii, for example, many of the echeverias, even of course, Dudleya bretonii itself can grow a nice farina in culture. But it's certainly something just to be wary of. Now, if we wanna be absolutely certain that we're not supporting this trade, then buy seedlings, or better yet, my favorite thing in the world, grow plants from seed. Have a look at this. This is a pot of about one month old Dudley of Bretoni eyes that I'm having a go at raising from seed as well. As you can see, they grow like weeds. What do we need to take them out of habitat for? So, I'm hoping that after everything I've said today, you now know a little bit more about what plant poaching is and you're a little bit better equipped to ensure that you're not supporting it. Certainly not knowingly. If you are, you can fuck right off now. But if you're not, if you didn't know about it before, well now you might be better equipped to ensure that you're not supporting what is essentially a global criminal network that strips habitats of their plants makes the world a worse place to live. Anyway, I'm Michael from Aridzine. If you've liked what you've seen today, there's a link right here where you can find all sorts of different ways to support what I do. Find me on Instagram. Buy a shirt if you like. Maybe you want to subscribe. I don't know. Anyway, I hope you learned something and uh, happy growing and try not to support poachers. See you next time.